Hello and welcome to today's YouTube worship here at High Street Methodist Church in Whitney. One of the interesting things about uh, doing things via uh, YouTube and preparing things in advance is of course one could be anywhere in the country or indeed anywhere in the world. And indeed when I was starting the preparation and planning and reflection for today's service I was on holiday up in the Lake District and I really thought seriously about recording this introduction, this call to worship alongside one of the lakes where which we were walking around one day because we were surrounded such by such the beauty and evidence of God's creation, the beautiful waters, the beautiful sunshine and the hills around about us. But it was a bit windy so I thought that probably wouldn't give very good quality. So I still have those images in my mind as we come to worship God this morning. Images of God's creation, images of those beautiful hills, images of those ripples as the wind blows the waves across the lake. And as we do that, and maybe we can picture those sorts of things in our minds, that we can realise that we are in the presence of the living God. It may be that this, today as we worship together in different places that we have that sense of God's presence. Uh, and really just I would just want to use that to feed into our first song which is to God be the glory. Because as we reflect and think about God's grace, about God's creation, about God's love for us, don't we just want to respond and say, to God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us, his son who yielded his life, an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Let's sing, to God be the glory.
Dear Lord, we appreciate the beauty of your world. We look around at the mountains, trees, lakes, rivers and the vast seas and it speaks of your great design. Then we look at the variety of shape, colour and fragrance of the flowers and see your majesty. Help us to show our love and reverence to you by caring for your creation. We look up at the night sky, the moon and stars and are amazed that you who created all this care about us. You share this awesome glory with us and we so often take it for granted and are sorry. We remember today those who we know who need comfort at this time and pray that you will be very close to them, holding them in your arms. As we look forward to thinking about worshipping together in a different way, help us to be guided by your spirit. We all have our anxieties about the current situation, but know that if we listen to you, you will guide and support us. Thank you that you who created our amazing world care about each one of us and that we can talk to you about anything on our hearts. We bring you our thanks and praise. Amen. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no ploughing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, and lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honour accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin embraced him weeping, and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Thank you for reading that passage from there from Genesis uh, chapter 45. Part of what's quite a long account in that book of Genesis about what one might describe as the dysfunctional family of Jacob. Let's just reflect to start with some of the aspects of that family history. Probably some of the things that if we were writing our own family history, we wouldn't really want to be recorded for future generations to see. Jacob, son of Isaac, or one of the twin sons of Isaac, the second born, uh, along with uh, Esau coming out just first. Although scripture records that Jacob was grasping the, the ankle, the heel of his brother Esau. And there was enmity, there was tension between them as they grew up. And indeed, Jacob misled his father 
into giving him the blessing that really should have been Esau's. Jacob cheated his brother Esau and received his father's blessing. And then he went off to find a wife and he found a wife, Rachel, and he agreed to work for seven years. And his incoming father-in-law, as it were, misled him. And on his wedding night, he slept with Leah. He was now married to Leah rather than Rachel. And he had to work another seven years before he could become the husband of Rachel. Rachel, the one that he really loved compared with Leah. You see the start of the dysfunctional family coming into play here. And then we have the situation where the, uh, Leah was clearly very fertile and she produced son after son after son. But also to try and uh, help Rachel, who was apparently not able to produce any children, Rachel gave her servant to Jacob that her servant might produce a child. And similarly, Leah did the same thing. And finally, Rachel gave birth to two boys. So there are now 12 sons of Jacob, six from Leah, two from Leah's servant, two from Rachel and two from Rachel's servant. And surprise, surprise, there is tension there is jealousy, there is disagreement. Ultimately, it becomes worse because Jacob so, so loved Joseph. He favoured him. He gave him a special coat of many colours that we know from the uh, modern show, the Joseph is a Technicolor dream coat. And Jacob, sorry, Joseph even went to the extent of having dreams and sharing them with his brother. Dreams that his brothers will be bowing down to him in due course. Dreams that became a reality, a truth, but perhaps not wise to share them with your brothers. And it got so, word, so bad that one time all the brothers were out together, including Joseph, and they thought how they could get rid of Joseph. They thought they could kill him and say to their father that he'd been killed by a wild animal. But then they realised they could get some money if they sold him into slavery as they saw some slave traders passing by. So they did that, he was taken off into Egypt and they took that famous multicoloured coat back to their father, Jacob. And said, look, here's the blood on the coat. Your son Joseph is dead. But he wasn't. He was down in Egypt. And he had a bit of a mixed experience there. Part of his time was in prison. Put there on a malicious accusation. But able to tell dreams. And that was part of the way in which he came out of prison and became effectively the Prime Minister of Egypt. And then famine came about, where Jacob and his children, his sons, his families were living, and they went down to Egypt to try and find food to stop them dying. And whilst there, they discovered their brother, the one they'd sold into slavery, was now the Prime Minister of Egypt. Now I just want to pause there and hold that story in your mind and ask you to come with me on a journey, a journey in April 2018. I set off in my car from Mr. Lovell, I drove to Carthen, I picked up my son Steve, 
and I drove to Cassington and picked up a friend from Stonesfield called Nick. I drove the three of us to Perryvale in West London. We parked the car there. We got the underground to Shepherd's Bush. And then from Shepherd's Bush, we changed to the train and got the train from there to Selhurst, changing at Clapham Junction. From Selhurst, we walked up to Selhurst Park, the home of Crystal Palace Football Club, the club that I've supported since I first saw them in 1964. And this wasn't just any old match that we'd gone up to see. This was the rivalry. This was the derby of the season. Crystal Palace versus Brighton. Very tense. We were playing brilliant football and at half time it was 3-2 to us. It was tight in the second half but we hung on to win 3-2. We had the victory over our rivals. And Steve and I were in one stand and our friend Nick was in another stand and we'd agreed where we'd meet after the match. We went there and Steve and I waited and waited and waited and the crowds were dying down and dying down and dying down. And eventually Nick appeared when there's virtually no one else around. Apologised for being late but he'd been distracted by chatting with some of his brothers and he decided that he was going to go off with them and find some way of getting back to Cassington and then in his car to Stonesfield. So we were somewhat later than we'd anticipated. We walked to Seller Station and this was great because no longer were there queues and shoves and pushing to try and get onto the uh, through the barrier and then up to the platform to get the train. We got through the barrier up to the platform, we didn't have long to wait for a train. The doors opened, there was plenty of space because normally it's heaving, and sometimes you can't even get on the train. And amazing, there was, there was a seat. A seat for both of us and we sat down. And virtually immediately after we'd sat down, the gentleman opposite us said, and what was your result today? See, he was a football fan travelling back for another match in Sutton. And football fans tend to chat to each other about football. And we talked about his match, we talked about what, who we were supporting and why we supported them. And this just sort of conversation went on, it drifted into other uh, sports. And somehow it ended up with a realisation that he had a brother who lived in Papua New Guinea on the other side of the world, just north of Australia. And just three years earlier, I had been to Papua New Guinea. I'd been there for a week to uh, work alongside the local members of Gideon's. And there were seven of us went from overseas and we worked in seven teams over three weeks, over five days rather. And we distributed 84,000 Bibles and New Testaments in those five days. Praise God for every single one of those people who received the opportunity to read God's word. So I had been to Papua New Guinea. His brother lived in Papua New Guinea. But not only that, I had been to Papua New Guinea a few years before then, because at the time our, eldest, our elder daughter was working in Papua New Guinea with Wycliffe Bible Translators. We went over and visited her, and we visited one or two places in Papua New Guinea, including the town where this gentleman's brother lived. I offered him a New Testament, having explained why I'd been in Papua New Guinea. And he was so pleased to accept that. And as we left the train at Clapham Junction, I looked back and there he was on the train reading a copy of God's Word. What was the probability that we should be on that train, sat down opposite that individual person, with both of us having links with Papua New Guinea. Do you not just see it as another example? May not may not uh, be as complex as that situation we're dealing with here, with the with Jacob and Joseph and his brothers, but still an example of the way that God is still at work today, working through His people, 
even where we're not expecting it to happen. So let's, with that realization, let's go back to the passage in Genesis and take it forward a bit. Because ultimately, when you move on to Genesis chapter 50, you see that Joseph is now looking back and all the different elements. He's able to look back and say to his brothers, you intended it, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. You, my brothers, intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. And I believe that still that same philosophy applies today. That there are many instances where others can be hurting us. And God will be saying, I'm intending that for your benefit, for your good. Although in, in Joseph's case, it wasn't just his own good, his own benefit. It was much, much bigger than that. And I think there were three key ways in which God was working in this miraculous way. First of all, to bring about reconciliation within that family. This was the family that God was using to take his promise that he made through Abraham forward. And I do not believe that if Jacob, sorry, if that Joseph had not gone down into, um, into uh, Egypt, I don't believe that the same sort of thing could have happened. But God works in miraculous ways. So he brought about reconciliation of the family. Secondly, he brought about a means to feed the people in this famine. Because the wisdom that, through a dream given to him by God, the wisdom that Joseph brought into that situation was to say, look, we're going to have seven years of plenty. We need to put aside food from those years of plenty, store them, and then they'll be available for the years of famine that are to follow. And that's exactly what happened, and that's why... Jacob and his 11 sons were able to come down to Egypt and have some of the spare food that in God's wisdom working through Joseph had been put, away, put aside in store to deal with the famine. And thirdly, and this is the real, real big picture lesson that we can draw from this, is that God was working in that family, through that individual, through his brothers, to ensure that the promise that God made to Abraham, that his seed, his family, his offspring will be a blessing, will be fulfilled through these 12 sons, these 12 tribes of Israel. Ultimately leading, of course, if you follow the genealogy down, to our Lord Jesus Christ, who was that ultimate fulfilment as he came to this earth, the Son of God, to walk this earth, to experience the temptations that we experience, and to go to the cross to pay the price that we might be forgiven. So there we have God working in a remarkable way step by step in the life of Joseph, in the life of his brothers, in the life of their father, Jacob. An example I hope you can see of God working through me in a way that I just wasn't expecting. And the encouragement and the hope that that brings for all of us is that as God's people today, God will work through us. Amen.
Now let us say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much for those intercessory prayers, which are all part of our encounter, our meeting with God this morning. As we've been reflecting through that passage from Genesis about the way that God was working through the lives of that dysfunctional family, God is still working his purpose out. And that's the, the song that we're going to use to close our worship, bring it to an end this morning. God is working his purpose out as year succeeds to year. as we've been reflecting today about God's sovereignty, about God at work today, let's use the words of, that Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 3 as our benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and forever. Amen.